We have come to Exodus chapters 24 through 26. If you were here last Sunday night, we were supposed to cover chapter 24, but we ran out of time as we were dealing with chapters uh, 22 and 23, so we didn't have the opportunity to get into the 24th chapter. So we'll study tonight 24 through 26. This morning we'd like to draw your attention to the 24th chapter, verses 3 and 7. We read in verse 3, And Moses came, and he told the people all of the words of the Lord, and all of the judgments. And all of the people answered with one voice, and they said, All of the words which the Lord has said, we will do. And so Moses then wrote down the words in a book. In verse 7, he took the book of the covenant and he read it in the audience of the people. And they said, all that the Lord hath said will we do and be obedient. Moses brought to the people God's laws. God's commandments, God's judgments, God's statutes. And as they heard the law of God, it resonated in their heart as true. And thus they responded, all that God has commanded, we will do. You see, the law of the Lord is perfect. And as I look at the law of the Lord, I also find my heart responding to it. In my heart, I know this is right. In my heart, I know that this is the way I should live. And it is the way I want to live. And so in hearing the statutes, the judgments, the commandments of the Lord, I realize that they are righteous altogether. There is nothing that I can argue against the law of God. It is perfect. And thus, the people in hearing the law responded, all that the Lord has commanded, that we will do. And yet... History shows that they did not do the commandments of the Lord. They did not keep his covenants. They did not obey his judgments. And thus, the promise that all that the Lord has commanded we will do was a broken promise because they did not obey the commandments. David speaks of his love for God's law. In some, Psalm 119, David said, Oh, how I love thy law. I meditate on it all day long. I hate vain thoughts, but I love your law. I hate and abhor lying, but thy law do I love. And yet, though David professed a love for the law of God, yet David broke the law of God. He coveted his neighbor's wife. He committed adultery with his neighbor's wife. And then he had his neighbor put to death so he could have his neighbor's wife. Three of the commandments he broke in just one affair. How many of the commandments, how many of the laws do you have to break before you become a lawbreaker? In reality, all you have to do is break one. 
and you're a lawbreaker. And it doesn't really make any difference which one it is. James said if we keep the whole law and yet we violate one, we become guilty of all. We become a lawbreaker. Paul the apostle wrote to the Galatians and said, For as many as are under the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continues not in all of the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. England in the olden days was famous for their archers. Of course, the legends and stories of Robin Hood and the skill with the bow and the arrow. And because it was a very popular thing in England, archery, they had many of their sports that dealt with archery. They had one game in which the men would gather together. Each one would be given a quiver of arrows, perhaps 10. They would set a pole out in the middle of this field and on the top of the pole there would be a hoop. And the object was to shoot your arrow through the hoop on the top of the pole. If you missed the hoop, with one of your arrows, you were called a sinner. In fact, that is where the origin of our English word sin came from. It literally means to miss the mark. And so if you would miss the hoop, you'd be called a sinner. You've missed the mark. That's what the Greek word harmatia, which is translated sin, uh, literally means, it means to miss the mark. And so we got our English word sin from this game of missing the mark, and it is a word that very adequately uh, interprets the Greek word harmatia. Now, let's say that we were involved in this game of sinner. And you stepped up, you shot your first arrow, because you were the first one up, you were a little nervous, and you nicked, but went outside the hoop. You missed. You missed the mark. You're a sinner. Let's say that the person following you shot his first nine arrows straight through the middle of the hoop, but then became a little overconfident and he didn't take careful enough aim and he missed with his 10th arrow. He's a sinner. He missed the mark. Let's say someone gets up who's just not very good. He misses all 10. He has missed the mark too but you're all in the same boat because you have all missed the mark. It doesn't matter which of the arrows missed, whether one or all, the fact that you missed means that you are a sinner. So with the law of God, it really doesn't matter which of the laws that you have violated, which of the commandments you broke, you're a sinner. You've missed the mark. And though you may try to hit the mark, have done your best to hit the mark, still you have missed, and thus you're a sinner. Paul the Apostle tells us that the law of God is holy. The commandments of God are holy. They are just and they are good. And Paul said, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. As David, he loved the law of God. He acknowledged that the law of God is good. 
this is right. It's the right way to live. And yet he said, I desire to do that which is good. Yet I can't seem to always do it. I know to be good. I want to be good, but I'm not. The things which are wrong, I often find myself doing. Oh, wretched man that I am. What is the problem? If the law is holy, if it is good, if I delight in the law, then why do I break the law? Why did Israel break their promise to God? They heard the law. They said, oh, yes, that's good. That's a good thing for us in getting along with each other. It's important for relationships. I can see where the danger would lie in breaking these laws because it would destroy relationships. I will keep it. And though there was the desire, and though there was the approval, yet they broke their covenant, their vow, and they broke the law of God. Paul declared the problem is in the fact that the law is spiritual and I am carnal. Our carnal nature is sinful. Paul wrote, I know in me, that is in my flesh, there dwells no good thing. When he was writing to the Ephesians, he said, we were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. God made an interesting assessment of mankind and I think we all fall in that category. God's assessment was there is none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understands. There is none that seeks after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher, and their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known." And there is no fear of God before their eyes. That is God's assessment of the natural man. As he looks at us, living after the flesh, this is what he sees and this is how he evaluates it. The children of Israel heard the law of God. They approved of the law. They promised all that God has said, that will we do. But God knew that when they said that, that they would not keep the law. God knew that the promises that they had made were empty promises. God knew that they would turn away from his commandments. And thus God told them the calamities that would befall them as a nation if they failed to respect his laws. How many times we have made promises to God. I know what is right. I approve what is right. And so many times we make a promise to God that we are going to do that which is right. And yet, we like the children of Israel so many times, 
When we make promises to God, we find ourselves breaking those promises. There are certain things that you have promised God that you would do for him. But somehow you never got around to doing it. There are certain things that you promised God you would never do again. And yet you've done them. Man seems to have a history of broken promises and vows. Why is it that we make a promise to God? Usually it's trying to strike a deal. Lord, if you will do this for me, then I'll do this for you. Hoping to sort of induce God to uh, help us out, to give us something that we strongly desire. So we make a promise to God, if he'll just do that for us, this is what I'll do for you. Or sometimes when we're in trouble, we make a promise, God, if you'll just get me out of this, then I'll serve you. And Lord, uh, and David uh, in the 66th Psalm said, I will go into your house with burnt offerings. I will pay you my vows, which my lips uttered and my mouth spoke when I was in trouble. And how many times in the times of trouble do we make certain promises unto God? I think of the alcoholic who has made so many promises never to drink again, especially maybe after the third arrest for driving while drunk. They make a vow, they make a promise, I'll never touch the bottle again. But the promises are broken. The person who discovers that they have lung cancer and says, I'll never smoke another cigarette as long as I live, and yet they go back to it. Or the person that says, I'm going to lose 10 pounds broken promises. I don't believe that the problem is a lack of sincerity. I really believe that when the children of Israel heard the law of God and they said, yes, that's right, that's the good life and that's the good way to live and we're going to do all that God says. I believe that they were totally sincere. I don't doubt their sincerity one bit even as I don't doubt your sincerity when you make certain vows and promises to God. I believe that in our hearts there is a strong desire and intention of keeping those vows when we make them. As Jesus said to Peter, the spirit indeed is willing, but then he hit the nail on the head. He said, the flesh is weak. Not a problem with my spirit, not a problem with my heart. I acknowledge that the law of the Lord is good. It is perfect. The ways of the Lord are righteous. The judgments of the Lord are true. I acknowledge that. I do believe that that's the way a person should live and surely that is the way I want to live. the desire in my heart to do that which is right. But like Paul, I often find myself not doing the things that I know I should do. And oftentimes find I'm finding myself doing those things that I know I ought not to do. And thus, so many times I'm disappointed with myself when I have failed, I sit there and disappointed. How could I have done that? I know better than doing that. 
Why did I do that? So disappointed with myself. But you know what? God wasn't disappointed with me because he knew I was going to fail. He knew when I made the promise that I wasn't going to keep it, that I would fail to keep the promise, even as he knew when the children of Israel said, all that the Lord has commanded we will do, he knew good and well that they weren't going to keep his commandments. In making a vow, it is actually putting trust in my flesh. Lord, I am going to, you see, the I, and it's putting confidence and trust in my flesh. But Paul said, I know that in me that is in my flesh there dwells no good thing. And it's wrong for us to put confidence in our flesh because though our spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. Does God have an answer for us who have made these promises and have broken these promises? I guess the first response is don't make promises. If you don't make promises, you won't break promises. I think better than making a promise to God, we should say, Lord, you know my heart. You know I don't want to do these things. Please help me not to do them. To know the truth about myself, that no matter how strong my desire might be to do what is good, evil is present with me. And thus, rather than promising God that I'm going to be good, just say, God, please help me to be good. And rather than a vow or a promise, make it a prayer. We remember how that Peter, when Jesus said to his disciples, all of you are going to be offended tonight because of me. Peter said, Lord, though they may all be offended, I will never be offended. Confidence in his flesh. Jesus said before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. He said, Lord, I would never deny you. I'll die for you. He was totally sincere. He meant that. And yet we know the story. He failed to keep that vow. And he did deny his Lord three times. It's not a matter of my heart not being in it. It's the weakness of my flesh. If God would just leave us in this state, then Christianity would be like every other religion, setting unattainable goals and rules for man. You see, people are attracted to religion because of the ideal ethics that they espouse. The ethics that Buddha taught are beautiful and idealistic. The same with Confucius. The same with Mohammed. But though they taught good ethics that attract people because I desire to be better. I desire to be good. Thus people are attracted to religion. They could not give a person the power to obey and to keep the commandments, the rules. And that only leads to frustration in time. It's like saying to a man who is filled with trouble and turmoil, has this unrest inside. If you will just sit on the top of Mount Everest, you will find complete contentment and peace. My heart is yearning for contentment and peace. I look up at Mount Everest 
And I think, oh, if I could only sit on top, I long for that peace and contentment within. But you're not given oxygen tanks. You're not given Sherpa guides. You're not given ice picks. Thus, you have no way to attain to the top of Everest. All you can do is look longingly, wishing that you could somehow sit there on the top and find the peace and contentment your heart so longs for. The thing that separates Christianity from the religions of the world is basically not the teaching of ethics, what is right and what is wrong. Most of the world's religions agree on the ethics of the religion. However, with Christianity, it doesn't just point to the ideal path and say, if you will walk this path, you will find peace, happiness, joy, fulfillment. But it declares you can't walk that path in your own strength or in your own power. It doesn't lie within your own ability to do that. And so Jesus said that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be witnesses unto me throughout the world. You can't do it yourself, but Jesus said in that day, you will know that I am in the Father and you are in me and I am in you. Not only that, Christianity offers to man the forgiveness when he misses the mark. It makes the provision when I have failed, when I have missed the mark, for my being forgiven and cleansed. And so it gives me strength to hit the mark and forgiveness should I miss. I know it's not news to you, but none of us are perfect. God says that we've all come short of his glory. There is none that is righteous, no, not one. But through the help of Jesus Christ, through the help of the Holy Spirit, the Lord is bringing us each day closer to his ideal. When the Lord talked to the children of Israel about their coming into the promised land, he said, I will drive out the enemies from before you, but I will not drive them all out in a single day. The Bible speaks about us growing in grace and in knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I am not yet what I will be. But thank God, I'm not what I was. I'm closer to God's ideal this year than I was last year. I've experienced victories in my life over the past year and growth in my Christian experience. I've not yet arrived. God is still working in many areas in my life. It's wonderful to see the progress that he is making in me. But you see, it is his work in me that is bringing the changes in my life. 
They are not changes that I have been able to effect by resolve or mesmerizing myself or other methods that people try to use to change their behavior. But it is the change from within through the power of the Holy Spirit, I am being transformed from within. And it's beautiful to watch God's work in my life. And I enjoy the victories that he gives. You see, if I could make a vow and a promise to God concerning an area in my life where I have been failing, and if I could say, God, I am determined, I will never fail in that area again. And if I could set a strong resolve and never fail in that area again, I would become an intolerable bore because I would want to be nailing every one of you and telling you what I did and how wonderful I now am because I finally made up my mind and set my mind to it and I used the power that's latent within me and I tapped in and... Now I am this and I am that. And I'd be constantly bragging about what I am. But because I could not make those changes and finally came with Paul to the cry, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And I found his help, his strength, and his deliverance in those areas where I have been changed, have been freed. All I can do is tell you what Jesus Christ can do for a poor, helpless person who casts themselves completely upon him and have discovered his work and his strength. God does not change his laws to accommodate our weaknesses, but God changes our weaknesses and gives us strength so that we can keep his laws. And so Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to those which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, not by us, but in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh are constantly thinking about the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. But to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life. It is peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, it cannot be subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if any man has not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And so God has made the provisions for you and for me. That in our weakness, his strength might be made perfect. He allows us to see our weakness. He allows us to see our failure. He allows us to come with Paul to that place of frustration. Oh, wretched man that I am in order that I will reach out beyond myself to the help that he has provided for me through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And thus, as the Spirit of God enables me, then I can be what I should be. I can be what I would be. Things that are not known or could be soon shall be my own. That glorious fulfillment that I experience when I see the victory of the power of God's Spirit doing for me what I tried and failed to do for myself, giving me victory over the life of the flesh, helping me to walk in the Spirit. Promises, promises. But really, promises are vain if they are predicated upon my capacity. But God has made promises that are sure and steadfast. And God's promises never fail. Moses wrote, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Hath he not spoken, and shall he not make it good? God keeps his promises. And you can experience God's power to give you victory over those areas of the flesh that have kept you in defeat. 